capitalist country. We're dealing with other things today. Far too many young couples find it hard to own their own homes. On the things that matter to people. Is irresponsible and it's wrong and they should... We have to make sure that we focus jobs and living standards and the National Health Service and schools. People worry about disrespect on the street. I've always believed... The British people... Here's what a Labour government can do for the people of Britain if it wins power. Before 1997, Britain had no minimum wage. For a hundred years, people campaigned for one, we delivered it. Millions of pensioners and children were lifted out of acute poverty. School results increased dramatically across the board. Crime was cut by a third. NHS waiting lists slashed so that by the time we left office, NHS satisfaction levels were the highest they'd ever been since the NHS was created. Today, after four defeats, just as in 1997, we have new leadership and a renewed sense of purpose and mission. Keir Starmer has shown strength, determination, and intelligence in setting Labour back on a winning path. He knows a Labour Party true to its principles is a Labour Party dedicated to winning power, to change our country again for the better. Well, hello everyone. Hope you can hear me. Press one in the chat if you can hear me. I've had a, uh, I've got a bit of a internet nightmare. Hopefully you can still hear me. I've got a bit of an internet uh, nightmare at the moment, which is that uh, my standard internet is down and this bloody 4G box I bought to plug the gap while these people are meant to be getting it fixed um, is really poor. Like, it, it, you know, it, it, it goes into having good signal and bad signal and it, I've noticed that in the daytime, the signal is bad. And then progressively, as the night wears on, it starts getting better and better. Um, so what I've had to do is I've had to uh, I've had to sidle over to the very kind of corner of the lodge on my laptop. And I'm stealing Internet from next door. Ladies and gentlemen, I am stealing next door lodges Internet. Um, so that is essentially the only way I, I was able to get this stream up and running. Um, so there we go. Uh, yes. Um, anyway, so I, I mean, the, the thing is, is that it's, it's not really stealing the internet because everybody pays for the same internet. It's just that my specific one is down. So I'm literally just kind of cadging next doors. I'm, I'm sure they'll be fine with it. Okay, now this uh, this stream is in lieu of Deepest Law, which uh, has was scheduled to be Marcus and Tristan talking about dietary stuff. That's been moved to two weeks' time. Next week, hopefully, will be the Francis Bacon one. My awful internet notwithstanding, hopefully they get it fixed by then. They were meant to get it fixed last week, and I still no sign of them. Um, but today, uh, the Daily Skeptic, uh, basically did an article on a document that was put out in December called Labour's New Britain or New Britain by Gordon Brown. OK, now, if you remember, in the last summer of tone stream I did, uh, we got to know some of the members of New Labour 1.0. And remember, I had that slide on the Brownites. Boo, hiss. Well, It seems like the Brownites have not gone away. And at the moment, it appears to be a, uh, a tug of war between Tone and Gordon, between Blair and Brown for uh, the heart of what this New Labour 2.0 is going to be and for which direction Keir Starmer goes in. OK, now the <laughs> the Blair strafe right strategy is super simple. OK. Um, and, oh, by the before I get started, I'll just mention I put a new Substack article out. Uh, it was on Blair in the name of the Summer of Tone. It was called The Paradox of Tony Blair, um, the Schmittian Liberalism of Divine Right. 
which is this curious mix of divine right decisionism that Blair has mixed with liberalism. Like how do those two things mix? So that's a new article I put out for free. Subscribe to my Substack if you're not. Most of my kind of big think content goes there. You also get audio versions of all of my streams as well uh, and, and various other things. Pick up a free one, pay for it if you would like to support me and support the Substack. Join this channel or um, the best thing you can do is pick up a course at the academic agency because you get quite a lot back for your money there, including leveling up your grammar, your rhetoric, your uh, logic skills, economics, politics, you name it. It's all there. Anyway, um, so the the pitch under the strafe right Blair strategy is very simple. The adults are back in the room. We're going to put childish things away. We are serious people and we are going to govern in the name of law and order. The streets are going to be safer. You can trust us on law and order. You can trust us on immigration. You can trust us on the economy. You can trust us not to mess things up as badly as the incompetent Tory party. We are going to get rid of the nonsense you saw under Jeremy Corbyn. We are going to be, you know, the government, capital G. That is the cell under tone. OK, that is the, the Blair strafe right cell. And Keir Starmer has been doing it fairly well. OK, over the past several months, started in about February or March. And we've been tracking his progress on Twitter and on this channel and elsewhere. I've got people sending me stuff all the time. Uh, just today, John McConnell, uh, the former shadow chancellor under Corbyn, was saying that, uh, was saying that uh, you know, um, it's a disgrace what's happening. We're being purged left, right and centre. Starmer is like deeply undemocratic, yada, yada, yada. Okay. However... There was always a second side to New Labour. Blair and his crew were the pragmatists. They were the the real politique guys. They were the, uh, you know, and as per the article I've just written, they do have, or Blair personally does have this kind of messianic streak, which is very interesting in and of itself. But uh, this is somewhat different. That That is still, how can I say, uh, almost like kind of, post-political or beyond politics, that that form of kind of divine, what I'm calling the divine right of Tony Blair. It's like he has already seen the future. He has pre, predetermined and preordained what the future will look like. Because, and it's happening and it's inevitable. And the only question is how we steer it, right? Remember, sovereign is he who interprets. Sovereign is he who makes the exception. This is Pure Schmidt, okay? Gordon Brown was never like that and is, is not like that. Blair was all about the sofa politics, the actually finding ways beyond the normal way of doing things. Uh, Gordon Brown was much more about um, kind of, boof, here's my desk capital, here's my... 100,000 page treaty on how to rethink economics and all this sort of like Gordon Brown, as I've said before, is and was a theory cell. Okay. And he was much more academic and much more dusty and much more uh, left wing than Blair. Okay. And this basically was unelect like it, this was the unelectable side of New Labour which was sidelined when Blair was the prime minister and he won the three elections. But they were always a faction. And for whatever reason, Tone and friends were never able to fully purge the Brownites like they've done to the far left. Uh, they stayed on. And in fact, they, they ended up purging the Blairites. Uh, Brown had 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. And uh, in that time, he set up a lot of... Uh, a lot of things, uh, Quality Act 2010, for example, um, he made a lot of changes and uh, basically 
kind of started doing bad old Labour stuff because Brown, as we'll see, is much more. Uh, he kind of designs policy like like a kind of theorist as well as we, and this document that they've put out the new Britain doc document is very very Brownite in in character. Um, so um, let me just uh, get you a uh, get you. I've put links to the document um, there. But it's a very long document. It's like, um, I think it's like 150 pages long. It's super convoluted. And I'm not going to be going through it word by word. A very good effort has already been made by Scrump and Evelyn. And I will be playing a portion of their stream because our buddy Morgoth uh, was saying like, uh, you know, everybody was sending around a screen grab of... Uh, part of the brown document and Morgoth was like I don't really see why that's so bad and on the face of it it doesn't look kind of quote-unquote that bad um, because you know it looks like a kind of localist vision for Britain. Uh, Scrub and Evelyn I think do a very good job of actually uncovering what Brown is attempting to do uh, with this. Before I get to uh, the uh, that though i'm going to share something from the daily skeptic and uh, i'm also going to give you my immediate reaction to this um which is twofold one if starmer runs on this right if he if he if he runs on this new britain manifesto authored by gordon brown he is going to lose the election a lot of people think oh the plebs won't care about all of this. It's all too boring and so on. That's not what matters. What matters is what the Tories can do with it in an, ele in an election campaign. Okay. Now, it much depends on who runs. If it's Sunak, I reckon Labour could run a cabbage against Sunak and they'll win. Okay. Doesn't matter what the issues are. But if the Tories come to their senses and run Boris, Again, or somebody similar to Priti Patel, say, but ideally Boris against Starmer, and he's running on this, not on Blair Strafe Right, but on this Gordon Brown document, Labour will lose because the Tories will be able to say correctly that Labour are trying to end democracy as we know it. Labour are trying to stealth in a kind of communist revolution they'll be able to run a lot of those narratives they ran against corbyn uh again so um it, it's not really about whether uh boris is damaged goods or whether you know this what this document lays out is so radical and so thoroughgoing in how it would change how power works in this country, that um, a Labour would not be allowed, I don't think, by the Tories to get away with running on something that would basically forever change the unwritten constitution of Britain as it stands today. Because what they're basically trying to do is they're trying to write a new constitution for Britain uh, and, and completely rework how the power structures function in the country and to do that without a referendum to do it just based on a set of election pledges and so on is not really on and i don't think they'll get away with it i think it's too radical and i and i mean the the machiavelli and blair thing to do would be to not mention any of this stuff to win power and then to do some aspects of what brown's plan is here right but the brown way of doing, like, here's my manifesto of all these crazy things I want to do, here they are up front, is just a gift to the Tories. It's a gift to the Tories, this is. Um, so my uh, true belief is that this is bad from a messaging point of view for, for New Labour as a project, uh, New Labour 2.0, and that it could actually uh, damage uh, 
Starmer's political chances. Let me just read what uh, Daily Skeptic said. And then uh, there's a very complicated, this really complicated document, badly written by Gordon Brown. It's not clear at all. It's It's got theory cell written all over it. Uh, Scrump and Evelyn did a really good job of coming up with a diagram for what like this new Britain would look like. And also they highlight some of the real dangers with this. Um, I have, you know, if this, if Keir Starmer runs on this, uh, I will just, there's just no way I would vote for him. I'll just put that out there right now. And I don't believe that the target audience of people that they have, which is basically people who voted Tory in 2019 and are disappointed with the Tories' lack of action, want immigration under control, want crime sorted out, uh, all of those sorts of people who they have been correctly targeting, I think they would lose pretty much all of them if this becomes the platform, okay? And I have noticed that it is still on the Labour website. This is on the Labour Party website, okay? It was put up in December 2022. It hasn't really been talked about much by Starmer, but Daily Skeptic have drawn attention to it today. And this has been the talk on British political Twitter today. So this is why I'm uh, I'm doing a, um, a stream on it. Okay, so this is Jay Sorrell in the Daily Skeptic. He says... In theory, Britain is the most democratic country in the world. There has never been any limit to what uh, an elected parliament and a royal signature can do. The, obstru the obstructions to an elected majority only exist by sufferance to, of this power and could be abolished at will. This is basically what um, Herbert Spencer back in the late 19th century called the divine right of parliament. Britain is not... A, is a true parliamentary system, unlike America, which has got all of these kind of, um, you know, Montesquieuian checks and balances and all this bullshit, okay, where the, you know, the president tries to act, but then the Supreme Court strikes him down or the, you know, the, um, the Congress tries to pass some legislative, tries to pass some new laws, then you know, some judge somewhere else finds a problem with it. Um, the American system has got basically the judiciary, the executive and the legislature, which kind of fight in this scissors, paper, stone game. OK, and it was designed to make um, to kind of set up more barriers for radical change by the founding fathers. The British system doesn't work like that. Um, essentially, the powers that were vested in the monarchy um, were devolved down to Parliament. Um, so, you know, there was divine right of kings. Still, in theory, in theory, the power in Parliament is derived from the crown. But in practice, of course, not all of that is rubbish. I mean, crown doesn't really matter it just kind of rubber stamp stuff and is there as a kind of constitutional symbolic head of state um i mean legally speaking the king still has to rubber stamp everything and so on um and the prime minister has to ask permission of the monarch to form a government but in practice when you elect the tory party or the labor party on a majority, as we elected Boris Johnson's cabinet uh, or Boris Johnson's Tory party in 2019, they had that 80 seat majority. In theory, they can do whatever they want. And there's nobody to stop them. There's no, I mean, there is a Supreme Court that Blair tried to set up. But in practice, that does not have the powers that the Supreme Court in America has. Okay. Um, there is basically nothing to stop Parliament doing what it wants. If the Tory party had true, like, heroic will, they could have come in and, with their 80-seat majority under Boris, and they could have been like, right, we're getting rid of the Supreme Court, we're getting rid of um, the Equality Act 2010, we're getting, like, they can do whatever they want and nobody could stop them, okay? 
for good or for bad, that is how this country works. OK, now you, you, you may actually believe that what Gordon Brown is suggesting here is better. And that's up for you to decide. But that is how things have functioned in this country for a long time. Uh, the House of Lords exists um, as a kind of check. But in practice, they can't actually do that much. Um, all the House of Lords can do is if the House of Commons has agreed to pass a law or a new bill it, into law, it has to go to the House of Lords for them to give their approval. And the House of Lords can say, oh, we're, we're not really up for this. We're going to send it back, revise this bit or revise that bit. But in practice, I mean, they do do that. The, the House of Lords do occasionally make the Commons revise legislation. Uh, but in practice, uh, they never really... If, if the House of Commons has made up its mind that this new bill is going to go through, the House of Lords are not going to be able to stop it. OK, they can only hold up stuff for so long. Right. So there's a limit to what the House of Lords can do in practice. Uh, in the like the, the, there's a different in the British system. There's all this kind of legal theory. I'm sure apostolic majesty or somebody like that, you know, who's into all of that stuff could go into you know how things are meant to work in theory but in practice the house of commons is all powerful okay um they can pretty much discipline the lords if they want to okay also um since blair uh made changes to the house of lords they have absolutely stuffed it full of politicians it's become like a retirement chamber for uh, old mps and of course, as we saw during Brexit, those lords like Michael Heseltine or John Major or people like this, grandees in the in in the Tory party or in the Labour Party, uh, they can actually, you know, they can cause trouble if a uh, if a government is trying to like make too much radical change, I guess. But they ultimately were not able to stop Brexit happening, even like when the whole system was trying to be obstructionist, the House of Lords really still couldn't stop it. And neither could the Supreme Court. Remember that woman with the uh, with the spider? Remember that? And the proroguing and all of that sort of stuff? Ultimately, they couldn't stop it. They tried all these different levers, but ultimately, the House of Commons and the Parliament is sovereign in this nation. Okay? So anyway, let me carry on. Hopefully, people can still uh, hear me. Um, if I make any mistakes, by the way, uh, I'm sure somebody will correct me, but my understanding is this country works in practice exactly in the way that I, I just outlined. Um, Blair is a little bit of an exception in so much as when he was in power, he really limited the role of anybody but himself in his inner circle. And he practiced something called sofa politics. And he was he kind of did a lot of bypassing of the normal of the normal channels. And he had outside bodies and consultants and quangos and private public partnerships and so on. This is a very new labor thing. And as we'll see, even even though um, this brownite plan is, you know, bad politically, I would say that in spirit, at least, there is a continuity between Blair and Brown on this sort of thinking, right? Um, I'm not sure that Blair would have put together a document like this because he's smarter than that. But in practice, when he was in power, he did do a lot of this sort of stuff where he was actually trying to establish like parallel power structures and trying to like entrench his own guys into the system, right? Um, many of which, by the way, the Tories did, did not remove. Um, I mean, a big one I would point to is Ofcom. When uh, Bo when Boris Johnson came to power, overnight the Tories with that 80 seat majority could have just said, Ofcom doesn't exist anymore. We, you know, through a wave of our magic power hands, 
we abolish Ofcom. But the Tories didn't do that. The Tories expanded Ofcom. The Tories made Ofcom uh, responsible for the internet. Uh, the Tories brought in uh, additional powers of Ofcom to be able to tell advertising agencies that they have to enact, you know, various standards of gender equality and of racial racial stuff and all this sort of thing. Um, the Tories, basically, since 2010, have strengthened more or less every single thing that New Labour did, which is one of the reasons I hate them so much. Um, they have not used their divine right for anything, really, that we would cheer on. That's why I hate the Tory party. I want the Tory party to be destroyed. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to happen if the public and indeed if the Tory party at large get wind of this document. Uh, this will be the Tory party's ticket back into power. Mark my words. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I know... I I understand that the 80 seat majority, you know, like um, we live under the regime, right? So they're not going to do any anti-regime stuff. But really, the only actual technical reason that the Tories didn't do those things that I outlined is because the individual MPs, for whatever reason, didn't want to. If the Tory party wanted to, if they had the political will, they could have done any of those things I've mentioned so far. They could have got rid of the Supreme Court. They could have got rid of the uh, Ofcom. They could have got rid of the Communications Act. They could have got rid of um, Equality Act. They could have uh, massively uh, diminished the power of uh, many, many of the quote-unquote independent regulatory bodies that uh, New Labour set up in the 2000s. They didn't do any of that stuff. They could have abolished the uh, Minister for Equalities, right? They could have abolished so many different things, but they didn't do it. And the only conclusion that I have, which is the only rational conclusion, is that the Tories didn't do it because the Tories are left-wing, because the Tories believe this shit themselves because the Tories are a false opposition, because the Tories need to be destroyed. Tell me, tell me, tell me otherwise. Anyway, let us uh, carry on with this. The rule of law, whatever that means, does not rule in Britain. Parliament does. Glance at the alternatives at provincial Hawaiian judges vetoing federal border policies as a matter of course. Not so in Britain. Tomorrow, parliamentary sovereignty could abolish the Supreme Court. It could abolish the BBC or the Human Rights Act or Whitehall itself. This power has seldom been exercised. I mean, it would be nice if they did sometimes exercise their theoretical power, but that's another, another discussion, I suppose. But that is scarcely the point. It exists. More than that, it burns white hot at the centre of national life. We've taught, we've caught tantalising glimpses of it before, where Britain's membership of the EU was brought to an end with a single vote of the legislature. This counts for more than a little. President Trump attempting to exercise some kind of federal veto over a Californian gender self-ID law would have instantly spawned a national crisis. In Britain, something exactly analogous passed off with a little more than a shrug. And that's true. Carl, was it Sunak who did that? Was it Sunak who passed that gender self-ID law uh, thing? It was not like he, he struck it down in Scotland, I remember. Parliament status means that Britain is uniquely capable of carrying out the kind of course corrections that healthy democracies have been able to make from time to time. New Labour and its heirs fear this above all else. And actually, just to take a step back a moment, okay? Now, everybody knows, anybody who's read The Populist Delusion knows, I am not a Democrat, right? I do not, I think democracy is a sham. But what we're really getting at in 
what this chap in the Daily Skeptic is talking about is the ability of a government to exercise Schmittian decisionism, to act decisively and without constraint in a straightforwardly Hobbesian manner. That's what he's talking about. The last prime minister we had who actually did that was Tony Blair, believe it or not, only in a direction that many people may have not have liked, but he did use those powers when he had them. The Tories, for whatever reason, all right, let me not get on another rant about the Tories, but that is what that is what this guy is getting at here. It's the ability to act swiftly and decisively. And this is what this document by Gordon Brown is trying to prevent, believe it or not. He is, Gordon Brown is trying to put the country of Great Britain, as I understand it, if I understand this document correctly, in a kind of progressive freeze whereby the the values and the social mores and the attitudes of right now and the concerns of right now are basically enshrined and entrenched in the system so that they can never be removed. That is what Gordon Brown is trying to do. He is trying to constitutionalize things as they exist right now so that we have essentially a permanent progressive kind of neoliberal ruling class forever by constitutional decree. I will carry on. They are right too. Accordingly, the main thrust of their constitutional program has been to destroy parliament and its powers. Curiously absent from contemporary lowing about institutions and the need to defend them is Westminster itself. Established Britain believes that bureaucrats and seamy quangos are beyond criticism, but has over the past 25 years outsourced many of Parliament's powers and has removed its judicial function entirely. Weekly proposals emerge to chop, change and transform it out of all recognition into some kind of rigmarole of estates, half feudal, half Dr. Seuss. Assemblies of the North, assemblies of great British high street heroes, an assembly of nations, regions, Auntie Beebe and Richard Osman, assemblies of Head, Hart and Hand, an assembly of the Potteries, an assembly for young people aged 33. The proposals of Keir Starmer's A New Britain Constitution, written up by Gordon Brown, are designed to destroy Parliament forever, and by extension, anything approaching popular sovereignty in Britain. These are the subordination of Parliament to the judiciary, universal English devolution, the reorganization of Britain as a multinational state, and the, and this is the most important bit, the enshrining of the current social order as a constitution. A new Britain will close off any route to democratic change. Blairite society, threatened by new adversaries and still more by new technologies for sharing information, seeks to preserve its waning powers by transforming the UK into an ungovernable ramshackle outfit on the pattern of late Poland, Lithuania or the Holy Roman Empire. A series of... Uh, <clears throat> Legal devices will be cooked up to prevent any change from our trajectory towards mediocrity and impoverishment. Consider small boats. Under the current system, a reforming government could solve the problem of illegal immigration tomorrow. It could legislate to make the Rwanda scheme legal. That's actually what Blair wants to do, by the way. But let's, let's leave aside the difference between Brown and Blair for the purposes of this article. Uh, or leave the ECHR or declare a state of emergency. Carl Schmidt, remember, the exception, crisis. That is where power really comes in. This would require a simple majority in the House of Commons, or in extremis, the creation of several new hundred peers. With a new Britain and judicial review, the issue will be taken entirely out of elected hands. Judges will simply enforce the principle that every human is entitled to live 
in a Western country. The Brown Starmer proposals will throw away, uh, will throw the slow recovery of the British Union into reverse. Under this system, it will be declared that Britain is a union of nations, four discrete legal entities that can enter or leave the arrangement at any time, and that can conduct something approaching an independent foreign policy. A country recognises a right to unilateral succession, but a new Britain will create the legal basis for just this. A nationalist devolved administration would have the legal standing to demand a referendum or independence under a gerrymandered franchise of its choosing. A new Britain will strengthen the forces of bureaucracy at every level of life. New and empowered devolved administrations in England will create tens of thousands of jobs for the political class. Each will have a permanent staff, bureaucracy, a network of quangos and taxpayer funded NGOs. You can see why this is a this is horrible, horrible. The ranks of English devolved government will be filled by the same curtain twitchers, village solicitors and local tyrants that form the officer class of the SNP and Plaid Cymru. Basically, a massive expansion of permanent parasites who want to tell you how to live your life. That's basically what this is. And do you remember, if you go back and watch my, I mentioned Thomas Hobbes, one of my most viewed articles, uh, uh, videos on YouTube is called Thomas Hobbes's Arguments for Absolute Monarchy. And one of the arguments that Thomas Hobbes makes is basically that um, the king can only have so many flatterers, right? There are oh, his actual circle is quite small, so um, you know the the scope for corruption is therefore limited to the total amount of people in his court. Whereas if you have let's say six hundred and fifty MPs, you now have six hundred and fifty sets of flatterers, each of which have a little circle of potentially corruptible people around them. Right, uh, you you then expand that to the local council level, where you have entrenched corruption at the local level, and what Gordon Brown wants to do is he wants to multiply this by like another tenfold. So you know, in Hob in Hobbes's terms, the total amount of flatterers in the system is now quite vast. This is bad. This is just like bad from a from a from the point of view of wanting to keep um, uh, power reasonably centralized and reasonably and corruption reasonably minimized. I, I mean, I still agree with those arguments by Thomas Hobbes. Schmidt, I believe, would say the same thing. He wouldn't be up for all of these tiny little devolved bureaucracies or uh, everywhere. Because each one of them is fucking trouble, I'm telling you. You, you know, on, on the one hand, you could think, oh, well, that's good. Because in my local council, everybody's conservative. And we'll have a lovely, our little devolved government will be conservative. But that is not actually how things have worked in practice. How things have worked in practice is that globalists, NGOs, networks, have got in at that level. And they have infiltrated at the local level. Right. That is how the Welsh Assembly and the SNP, just like this guy pointed out, are more gay, by which I mean global American empire, more globalist, more progressive, more out there, more insane than the national parties are. And so it will be when this Gordon Brown, if this Gordon Brown system ever came to pass, they would basically massively increase the number of really annoying leftist activists in our system. That is what would happen. Uh, let me carry on. An enthroned Jackie Weaver in every town hall, nor will there be any escape from these people. A new Britain contains an explicit promise that Westminster will not infringe on the powers of local government or even reduce its budgets without three years prior notice. In London, the long battle between the elected power and the bureaucracy is finally to be settled in the latter's favour. 
a new Britain will remove an elected government's ability to fire officials or abolish departments and will give Whitehall a statutory exercise. These will no longer be individuals that the state happens to employ to carry out its business and will instead harden into a permanent cast of noblesse de robe. Finally, the proposals would codify a set of social rights that will attempt to transform the particular assumptions of Britain's media class in the 2020s into eternal principles of national life. Now, this is awful. Can you imagine the typical BBC journalist trying to write something like the founding documents of the USA? Because this is basically what this Gordon Brown bullshit document is. He is trying to write a new constitution and he's trying to enshrine 2020 values as eternal principles. You know, this would be the exact opposite of putting the woke away. This would be enshrining woke as something that never goes away, ever. As as basically in the kind of new basis for a, for, for a new constitutional Britain. <clears throat> this rights package would again be placed beyond the power of parliamentary majority to change. Chief among these social rights is a guarantee of health care free at the point of use. Now, th this is something, by the way, this, this uh, health guarantee that is very different between Gordon and Tone. Blair continually talks about the fact that people are going to have to pay for NHS services and that parts of the NHS are going to have to be privatised. Gordon meanwhile is very old labor on this and very like no the nhs needs to be free at the point of service and this is a right so you can see a struggle a tension between the blairites and the brownites on on the on the nhs um and again some people watching this may agree with gordon brown on that some people may agree with blair you know you takes your money and you makes your choice as they used to say but in other words the particular health bureaucracy that was established in 1948. Immigrants to Britain are to gain a constitutional right to welfare payment under this system, as the social right to not live in poverty will extend to every person legitimately present in the UK. So to not be poor is now a fucking human right, according to the new, the new, uh, the new Brown Constitution. I mean, this is mental. This is this is nightmarish this is worse than bloody soviet union russia constitutions are not meant for enshrining fiscal decisions and it is the very it is the very thought that they might which shows why this whole exercise is so troubling you know i mean you say what you want it was the fourth of july yesterday and i, I know i give americans a lot of shit okay i'll hold my hands up and say i do engage in a bit of the old anti-american rhetoric but the founding fathers were bloody godlike geniuses compared to these to these people right now. Okay, they I mean they were careful in the way they wrote those founding documents and the constitution. They were careful and they thought of a lot of eventu eventualities. These people haven't. These people have said, "Oh, well, what do we think now? Let's make that something that lasts forever." This is insane. And it must never be allowed to happen. You know, the very prospect of this happening is is probably enough for me to, you know, despite all the other things that the bloody abject, horrible Tories have done, I would vote for them to stop this happening because this is fucking mental. Um, I will I will carry on. Uh, <clears throat> it is no exaggeration to say that the British establishment in twenty twenty three does not uh, believe in politics. The idea of popular sovereignty is almost non-existent. There is no instinctive grasp of the pull and push of democratic society. The idea that national life turns on appeals, coalitions, rhetoric, which are all uniformly dismissed as division. Instead, the and this, this actually does speak to a bit of the article I just put out on the substack. Blair is liberal to the extent that he pitches what he wants beyond politics. He sees politics as a kind of irritating and childish distraction from what really needs to happen. 
that is true of all of these people. Um, it's just the brown is a bit more like kind of socialist and theoretical in the way he goes about it. Blair is more kind of, I guess, dynamic and decisionist in the way that he does it. Um, uh, but but they they have this in common, this kind of distaste for friend enemy politics. They they want they want to move beyond that basically. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, instead of debating issues on their merits, they instead consult the rule book to find the right answer, our commitments, our international obligations, the government's own code of ethics, the Nolan principles. This is a group of people who have only recently figured out that politicians lie. This is a group of people who convened a committee to investigate parliamentary deception, found the defendant guilty, arraigned the defendant again for having misled them by preventing, presenting an unsuccessful de defence, and then declared that any criticism of the committee's proceedings is tantamount to critical harassment, uh, criminal harassment. This is a group of people who have all the democratic consciousness of Croat gentry in pre-March. A new Britain will not create the separation of powers as seen in Japan or Germany or the United States. Only an oligarchy that is genuinely perplexed and enraged by the concept of political opposition. With a new Britain, there will no longer be any necessary link between votes and actions, nor will there be any recognition that people are entitled to disagree with a series of subjective moral ideas. This is really crucial because if you watch the Scrump and Evelyn stream and if you, or if you read the Gordon Brown document, they basically want to make it impossible to undo this stuff. That if you if you voted for, let's say, the Tory party after they put this stuff in, the Tory party legally wouldn't be allowed to undo any of it. It would be tantamount to changing the constitution in America, which has got extremely high barriers and is basically almost never done right. Um, this is what they're trying to do in this country. Liberal democracy, as we know it, will cease to exist and will plunge deeper into crisis, barred by law from pursuing any alternative. That is, you know, don't don't you dare try to do anything about refugee crisis or woke stuff or any of these kind of stupid maladies that we have now that could easily be remedied with a, a little bit of political will. Uh, now, legally, couldn't be if the Brown Plan was put into place. It would enshrine it forever. It would basically lock the nation into a kind of freeze where we always live in 2023. Can you imagine? That is the last place anybody wants to live, is 2023 Britain forever. You know, what is that line in Orwell? You know, if you want to see the future Winston, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. You know, in this case, it'll be, imagine a pride flag, you know, slapping you on the face with a dildo forever only that's in a that is enshrined in the constitution now you know um uh, the current system of parliamentary democracy is worth everything it does not currently have many apologists but it should it is not as critics allege a medieval anachronism it is the precise opposite if we define secular modernity as the idea that the world is what we make of it, and that we are not bound by unfalsifiable spirits and spooks, then it is the most modern system of governing going. It allows us to choose, to act, to create, to destroy, to change. There is no earthly rule book to consult. There is nothing to consult but ourselves. I mean, he's basically saying that the English parliament is already Schmitty and, and decisionist in all, in all of the good ways. I don't know if this guy actually realizes that. But that is basically what he's saying. These proposals would end this great contest and replace it with a society that is now obliged by law to sink into poverty and decline. Those who may wish for something other than the whims of Gordon Brown, Matt Shawley, and Hieza Hazakirikia should oppose a new Britain, or they will soon find any alternative to it closed off. Very good article. It was worth me doing a stream on that alone. But I want to share a few other things with you now. Um, this is the uh, the actual document. And I just want to zoom to the, the page that was doing the rounds earlier on. Um, 
this was the one that everybody was sharing on Twitter. And Mor Morgoth, of all people, who's one of the smartest people in our circles, he looked at this diagram and he said, well, I don't see really see the problem with that. And this is a danger because if people don't see the problem with what they're up to here, uh, they could sneak it like they, they, they could sneak into power and do this and we we do like if they do this it's game over seriously it's game over um short of actual revolution there will be no way out i mean i know it's a cliche to say there's no voting your way out of this but if they do this truly there will be no this is like the establishment of the permanent progressive um uh, dictatorship pretty much um it would it would completely transform how this country works now this is the the document that was doing the rounds okay it says old britain new britain britishness is defined how we are born per parent parentage and birth okay identity new britain Britishness is defined by what we do. Citizenship. Old Britain, British identity over all others. Culture. New Britain, British identity resilient alongside regional, ethnic, national, tridentity, whatever the fuck that means. Old Britain, a centralised state run by and from Whitehall and Westminster. Governing principles. New Britain, a state of nations where communities can make their own decisions. You see, and I think a lot of people on our side of things like the idea of localism, you see, because they think, well, I like my locality. I trust the people I live with. I see that as being a good thing. But that is not what this means. And this is why I want to hone, hone in on this. That is not, Gordon Brown is not saying, let's go back to the Shire. He's not saying that at all. Um, and even in a scrump, um, we'll outline exactly what he is saying in a moment, because it is very opaque, the way this document is written. And it is very kind of cunning in the way that it obscures the true intent behind what this is. OK, <clears throat> it is agnostic. So the old Britain is agnostic of the role of geography and family wealth in determining life uh chances opportunity the new britain it proactively equalizing opportunity for all citizens Ugh. where's that where's that uh you know that clint eastwood meme where he just kind of shudders i think it's from that um what's that film he was in that's what i just did i sh i kind of physically shuddered at that second part because if that is enshrined as a kind of constitutional norm in this country. That's basically it. That's that's communism in a box. That is communism. Old Britain, the power and wealth of the centre trickles down to the periphery. Redistributive model. The wealth of the nation is invested to create wealth everywhere. So, with all of that said, I'm going to now play about 15 minutes from Scrump and Evelyn's uh, stream, where they they basically try to map out what this local part means. Because I think it is the local route which will sell people on our side of on our side of things on why this vision, this new Britain vision, isn't such a bad thing. Because you may be thinking, well, I live in Wales. Right. I know people I know would be thinking, well, I live in Wales and we are constantly getting fucked over by London. There's bugger all in Wales. There's no jobs. There's no investment. There's no bloody nothing. Same in up in north, up in the north. Right. You know, the north is buggered. It's had nothing since Thatcher. Um, we could do with a bit of redistribution. We could do with a bit of wealth. We could do with a little bit of self-governance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is how they will try to sell you. OK, but that is not the benign intent of this document. That is the sell, but it is not what this is trying to do. 
let me now play this bit of Scrump and Evelyn. I'll shut up for a moment to let Scrump take us through this. In the second chamber of parliament, which should be legally obligated to consider the issue, taking evidence and oversight and debate it. Again, not legally binding, blah, 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 blah. So what they're talking about here is that if you look at this new structure, and we'll get to the lower, uh, the lower bits of it uh, later on, if you look at this structure here, where you see the counts of the UK, um, that is superseded by the counts of, uh, of nations of, and regions, which is what we're talking about, which is effectively overseen by the replacement for the Lords, the Assembly of Nations and Regions. So not only does the Assembly of Nations and Regions have power over what is the British Constitution, it has power over dispute resolution between all different parts of devolved government. So it has power over... Through its yeah. independent intergovernmental secretariat. Yes. And if you look at this, the yeah. judgments made through different compliance and corruption boards. So basically, the Assembly of Regions and Nations, as strengthened by the Supreme Court, and the independent secretariat, which are not, which will not be elected bodies, they will be appointed bodies, and they will have large primacy over what is this new power structure in the UK. As you can see here, the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish assemblies become part of what's called the Council of the UK. We'll go into some of this again later, what the detail is here, which then goes into the Council of Regions and Nations, which is then overseen by the Assembly of Regions and Nations. The input from Parliament here, so you can see that the devolved assemblies are actually being brought to heel by this structure. They are being folded into a greater and greater hmm. and greater layer each time you uh, go It's up. like there has, they have added three or four levels of federalization so that they can secretly centralize everything above that. Yes, that's what this is about. And you begin to see it as the document goes on. It's, again, I've had to draw this up by jumping around the document quite a lot. So sorry to interrupt, but I just want to say this is such dark shit. I don't mean that in the kind of dark Lord meme way. I'm just talking about like, God help us if this happens. Just God help us. Um, to go into some of the stealth devolution here, what I call um, the Council of Regions and Nations, Governments of England. Um, they talk about the creation of what is the Council of England, which, which uh, I can't spell, but and the Council of England may be Westminster as we know it now. It may not. We're not no. entirely sure. Um, we believe that the Council of England are formed for coordination. I I should mention as well, by the way that when this was released in December, the majority of the media saw it as trying to appeal to Scotland, right? That this was Gordon Brown's way of trying to win back Scotland for the Labour Party, um, which they need to do if they're going to win an election, okay? Now, because Gordon Brown is a shithead and a theory cell, he thinks that this will be the way to do it, okay? Um, my view is that they could easily do it by painting the SNP as a woke kind of mental mentalist out of touch party that has lost touch with normal Scottish people, right? And that if they want law and order on the streets and if they want to keep Scotland, Scotland, vote for vote for Keir Starmer, hail Starmer, you know the uh, you know the true Richard Spencer or whatever. That's the way they could win up in Scotland. Um, if they truly go with the Blair strategy. But this is, I suppose, another way of doing it, which is to say, well, listen, you know, you will be able to leave whenever you want if you go with Labour, you know. Now, as Scrump and Evelyn are getting at, that is not actually what it's doing. This is actually chopping the balls off of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly. It, it's kind of, it's kneecapping them, taking their legs from beneath them, and covertly centralizing more power. But it's doing it in such a way that I think will be have social, political, and cultural consequences that will affect everybody. And for this reason, I would not support it. 
even though I would love to see the SNP and the Welsh Assembly and the Plaid Cymru kneecap because they're cancerous parties, cancerous, um, this is not the way, like, this is not a way of doing it that I would personally support because I, there's too many... There's too many problems with it, as as we've been talking through uh, on this on this whole stream. Okay, I'll I'll let them uh, go again. Operation. It, I'll just. It's not actually explained very well here, but Council of England to bring together uh, English local government and Metro mayors with central government. So the Council of England is made up of all of these new Metro mayors, all of these new Metro kind of like London has assemblies. And local councils, and with, also possibly possibly unions. unions. They mentioned they mentioned unions. One of the parts about uh, England in particular, for and blah, blah blah. We meant to produce Parliament. Um, it, incidentally, do you know what this reminds me of? By the way, this reminds me of the Iranian system under the Islamic Republic. Right, the Iranian system is full of these kind of fucking council of experts and you know the you know inner sanctum chamber you know of of people who are basically kind of above politics but need to be consulted for anything to change and this uh assembly of the nation and regions kind of reminds me of the assembly of experts in the iranian system i don't know if gordon brown was taking inspiration from the ayatollahs or what but you know that's what it reminds me of So here's a bit more explanation of how this structure works. So you have the Council of England, which is a new body which will bring together local government and mayors. You have the Council of the UK, which is to manage relations between the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish and UK governments. Notice there's no mention of the English government there, yeah. east of which is responsible for its own legislature. What I think, and my theory is, that the Council of England is meant to be the prototype form of the devolved English assembly. Yeah. And that it will derive legitimacy from being made up of mayors and councils, so the, but it will effectively function. By the way, that's a really good description in the chat. This is a plan to make the Hunger Games real. This is the fucking Hunger Games. It really is. It's like, oh, right, well, we're in District 9 and you're in District 10. <laughs> I mean, it's a, that's a very good way of thinking about what Gordon Bryan is trying to do here. Making the Hunger Games real, you know. In this Council of the UK, alongside Holyrood, alongside the Welsh Assembly, and alongside well, Stormont. You can sort of look at it as they are, they are like sidestepping the issue of English supremacy through the vehicle of Westminster by turning the UK into this own fabricated legal fiction yes. that serves as an abstract political body, not as you know an imperial identity naturally grown out of the conjoining of yeah. three, four nations. So you you have so it so sorry, just to explain because they do explain this earlier in the stream and I have not explained on this stream, um, the Assembly of Nation and Regions is basically a, uh, a body of elected local representatives, mayors and kind of local, uh, not councils, but like these new things that they would set up, right, that effectively replaces the House of Lords, okay? And this body, this Assembly of Nations and Regions, would basically have some sort of oversight over the House of Commons. It would have greater powers than the current House of Lords. Um, and basically, Parliament would have to answer to it. Uh, also, Parliament um, would not be able to make any changes to the Assembly of Nations and Regions without the approval of the Assembly of Nations and Regions. This would be enshrined into a new constitution. So, you know, they would not be able to just say, like the next government coming in, wouldn't be able to say, well, we're just going to get rid of this new assembly because it's bullshit. Um, so you can you understand the danger, right? They are essentially setting up a new parliamentary body that doesn't answer to parliament. 
Uh, how exactly they are appointed or elected is a little bit more hazy, as uh, Scrump and Evelyn are talk talking. If, if you're trying to vote on local matters, you if, if you're trying to get a local matter solved, your local, you'll go to your local councillor, do 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 do, miss local councillor, miss local mayor, and we resolve this. And he'll go, uh, I'm not sure if that's constitutionally protected or not. And they'll go, Council of England, is that constitutionally protected or not? Council of England will go, I'm not sure. Council of England, Council of the UK, is that constitutionally protected? Then they'll go to the Council of Reams and Nations, and they'll go, um, we don't, we don't know, we don't agree. Uh, Assembly of the Nations and Regions, is that constitutionally protected? And they'll go, Supreme Court, is that constitutionally protected? <sighs> Secretariat, can we enforce this? Yeah. And then they'll go, yes, that is constitutionally protected. And then the councillor or the... Very, very USSR, would you not agree? I mean, this is very, like, Byzantine, Soviet-style, old left-type stuff right here. The mayor will go to you, sorry, we can't do anything about that. That's constitutionally protected. We can't change that area of law. And that that will be the entirety of like, local government under this system. Yep. You will attempt to solve a problem and you will find that there are layers of primacy above what any local official can do so that they are paralyzed in solving any problem which is related to the lives of British people. Yep. They are wholly subservient the step above them here. Well, it's the the conversation we sort of had yesterday. The, the corollary of this is that it completely changes up the way in which bills and new laws are introduced into Parliament. Yes. No longer do you vote for a local MP who you can give a document of which he can take to the Speaker in the House yeah, yeah. during Parliament and say, well, this session we're proposing this, or this session we're proposing this amendment to this pre law. It's not law. mentioned in here, but I believe that all of these new bodies will have the power to scrutinize certain pieces of legislation and they will replace either in part or in whole the ministerial committees that are made up of MPs. Mm. That seems to be an implied function here. It's not an explicit function, but it's an implied function. Okay, so for England in particular, it should also prove by the forum in which best practices shared as devolution, as devolution continues to develop. I mean, it, it, it should be obvious that Gordon Brown is trying to set up the thousand-year managerial bureaucrat right here. This is basically what he's trying to do. As well as form uh, a formal mechanism for engagement with UK ministers. I'll just switch back to the document. That's this section here. So they're basically saying devolution for England is developing. This isn't the last step. This isn't even the middle step. This is an in-between step. Right. So. We should preemptively take over Cornwall and restart yeah. the tin mines. We recommend the Secretariat, this is the independent, should produce and present to Parliament for consideration by the new second. I just think it's worth mentioning, by the way, that Secretariat isn't Scrump and Evelyn meaning about or messing around or, you know, trying to make it sound more sinister than it is. That's really, that, that's literally the term used by Gordon Brown in the in the actual document. The Secretariat. Yeah. <laughs> nice one, Gordon. Fucking twat. And Chamber in particular, an annual report and statement on the extent to which the solidarity clause has been fulfilled and on the work of the Council of Nations and Regions and it should have the power to make ad hoc reports of its fit. So it's basically like the Stasi that oversees this whole entire yep. process. <clears throat> so to go back to our, sorry, I'll, I'll get our document there. Got some notes in it. Um, all of this functions as stealth devolution of an English assemb uh, assembly, um, the creation of new mayors and new democracy, um, the levels and roles in terms of who votes for what and who oversees what is, is deliberately confusing. The solidarity clause will mean that all of this will have to move together. And the. It, it's just struck me, by the way, given the stream I did the other night on Blair and AI. That I, I wonder if Tone would look at all of this and just say, Gordon, this has all outmoded me. What you need is a set of rules that don't change, and you can replace all these new councils with a set of bloody computers. It can just be the AI, the Council of AI overlords. I wonder if Blair would want to take it that way. I wonder, yeah, I wonder. Legal obligation of cooperation and the constitutional obligation 
in terms of following all these new laws and these new rights will mean that there isn't anything going on um, in terms of localization at all. Um, it's pure power. It's full spectrum benefits, as I put it, and it, it all interacts together. You have to hunt around the document, but the new rights and protections interact massively with the assembly of regions and nations and the power of the constitution. It basically for anyone who remembers our brief discussion of democratic centralism. It, it's very, very similar to Soviet democracy. Yes. If you look at what's going on here, and you have your tiny little councils, your little troikas down there, and they go up through the councils to the Assembly of Regions and Nations, which is effectively the Supreme Soviet. It acts like a Soviet in that it is technically derived from all of the bodies beneath it, from the smallest local council, right up through all of this, from bits of parliament, they, they are the assembly of the will of the nation. But really, through the solidarity clause and through the constitutional primacy of the assembly of regions of nations and through the constitutional subservience of um, all the devolved bodies beneath them, effectively there is a layer of politics which is settled politics. Yeah. There are areas of British life and areas of British policy that you will that will be set in stone as constitutionally protected and you will not be able to touch and any government that inherits this structure and which is to alter it will find the process nigh on impossible mm. it, almost as if by deliberate yeah if you thought on picking the bits of eu institutions that have be, that became embedded in britain is difficult imagine trying to unpick this mess and also it serves really as a justification base for itself in that greater democracy equals more good in the eyes of this system. Well, if you're, if you're doing more voting, you're obviously more empowered. Yes. I mean, that, that, that couldn't not be true. Well, there's also another aspect to this. We need to go over it relatively quickly. Um, the other aspect to this... I mean, I, I would if I was to do juvenilian analysis on this, this is also Brown's way of replicating his power base. If you remember, I talked about the castles and the rival castles and the high-low middle mechanism. Well, currently, there are all different castles around the map. But if there was an insurgent party that captured power, all they would really have to take to be able to make legal changes is parliament. That is the ultimate castle to take. But Brown essentially in this system is building lots and lots and lots and lots of different castles which means the goalposts are moved for what actually somebody would have to do and on top of it the rules of those castles are written in such a way that somebody who has unacceptable views views that don't agree with the new constitutional rights would not actually be allowed to hold hold any of those castles it would actually be like barred from entry so it is a it is an attempt to create a pile of new castles that can never actually be taken that's what he tried that's what he wants to do with this in pure power terms this is the creation of an ethics commission and also a powerful new body to ensure all appointments of public life are made on merit merit these two here are Mentioned very briefly, they're not really mentioned in full. Um, they they talk about um, standards of public life. They talk about. I mean, maybe one thing worth mentioning here that yeah. one of your big portions of your integrity and ethics commission will yeah. be judging things like whether or not net zero targets have been met. Yes, or whether or not the uh, different different devolved bodies are meeting their you know, standards and priorities. And strength, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, is, I think they even state in here that, as we will go on to show next week, that it's a great benefit that Manchester <laughs> and the mayor of Manchester, Andy Barnum, has pushed the uh, net zero goal, not to, to not from 2050, but to uh, 2038 or something. Yeah, yeah, he's brought it forward. And that this is this is touted as a a good aspect of what's being done, so that they are going to push forward the system, so there's more of that. Uh, somewhat, and people ask about whether it's a social credit system. Don't worry, lads. Peterson is in control. So yeah, yeah I, I think Peterson's we'll. Um, I think 
we'll leave it there uh, in terms of the, the company. And I, I think you've got an idea. Problem. There's been a couple so of uh, super chats. Um, one of the, I, I would say that the main, the main question to ask is the one uh, of New Labour is the one that I asked uh, on Twitter earlier on, which is, let me, let me just find that tweet that I made. Um, uh, hold on a minute. Uh, um, yeah. So th this is the one, this is the kind of key question, I would say, which is that the, the kind of Blairite flavor of Starmer uh, started in February, March, like I said at the top of the stream. Uh, this was um, uh, John McConnell yesterday complaining about purging of the Labour left and so on. And the real question is, have the Blairites at this time sidelined the Brownites? Or are the Brownites, are Brownites still pulling strings and calling shots? And one of the things to keep an eye on as Starmer's new labor develops is actually the the old-fashioned uh, tussle between the um the Miliband brothers ed Miliband, brownite do you remember day david Miliband, blairite there has been talk of david Miliband coming back ed Miliband currently is a key advisor to key to, to kia starmer okay now, the Blairites blame Ed Miliband for a lot of the stuff that has happened. They also blame Gordon Brown for losing the 2010 election and for destroying the new Labour project and for basically opening the door for Ed Miliband to open the door for Corbyn. This is all on the Brownites. Like, this is all the things that the Blairites have been criticising the Brownites for for years, okay? If New Labour 2.0 is going to work for anybody's benefit and if it's going to uh, have electoral success, Tone has to get real with Gordon. And this time, I mean, if I was to draw on that, do you remember that film Carlito's Way? Do you remember? I'm Billy Branco from the Bronx. And Carlito fails to kill him at the start. That is Gordon Brown. Blair failed to kind of metaphorically kill Gordon Brown at the start of their term. And he allowed him in and he failed to purge the Brownites from new Labour ranks. And it's come back to bite him in the arse and it's come back to bite Labour in the arse and the Blairites in the arse. Not once, but this would be the third time. Once it was Brown himself. Second time was Miliband, third time. And like fired or sidelined David Miliband brought in. That will be the sign that you know that Tone is winning in the party, okay? If you start seeing more Ed Miliband and people like bloody Angela Rayner and people like that, that is how you know that Blair and friends are losing in the party and the Brownites are winning. OK, so this is something to keep an eye on. Um, I believe that if they go with a Brownite version of New Labour, the Tories will win. Um, that is contingent on it being somebody that's not Rishi Sunak. We have to hope and fucking pray that the Tories don't run Sunak, because if it's Sunak, even versus a Brownite Starmer, I think that the party, the, the country will vote uh, Labour, just purely on the fact that Sunak is, I mean, I saw something the other day, right, that I couldn't believe it was so pathetic for Sunak. Let me just find this, because if this is real, I mean... Where, 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 let me let me just show you this, okay? Now, I don't know. I couldn't actually verify this because um, it was only like a tweet. I I did try to like fact check it, 
But if this is real, let, 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 me, let me show you this. It's just unbelievable. Rishi Sunak is finding Prime Minister difficult over the last few weeks and doesn't feel like he's being rewarded for anything. Fucking hell. You're not in prep school now, Rishi. You're not going to get like a gold star and a prefect's badge for doing a for being a good boy. You twat. God's sake. I mean, they're so they're so hopeless. I hate them so much. See, they, and this is where we are. We're, we're stuck between that shit show over there and the prospect of this coming in on the other side. So anyway, I don't see a lot of hope on the horizon in UK politics. Um, we have to hope that uh, Blair is able to talk some sense into Keir Starmer and say, like, listen, if you do this stuff, you're going to lose. Uh, you have to distance yourself from this insane socialist plan of Gordon Brown's because the public will rightly perceive it as Soviet because it is Soviet. Um, and instead, you know, I mean... Blair's vision is still dystopian, don't get me wrong. It's But his vision is much more like pub, public-private partnerships, kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of the, some of the WEF stuff, Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, you know, he, he, he won't leave the climate bit behind. There's the kind of techno, techno future. I mean, that's pretty grim as well, don't get me wrong. But it wouldn't lock us into the kind of thousand year brownite freeze that this document that we've gone over would today and if you ask me it is imperative that the blairites are able to purge the labor party of any remnant of of this brownite plan that we're looking at today um otherwise we're basically going to be stuck with the tories forever um and we, we will have to we will all have to through gritted teeth vote for the Tories again to stop this happening. Not that they'll do anything, by the way. They'll probably start enacting bits of it themselves, but we can, like nobody can vote for what I what we've read out today. All right, let me just read some super chats and we get out of here. Sergeant Hodel says, Bronze Age Pervert released a Caribbean Rhythms cast with mold bug today. Also, tip for the frogs. Gumroad's audio player is horrible. Use VLC player instead. It's 1,000% better. Um, okay, yeah, that's a good tip. I, I don't like Gumroad's player. It, it always kind of goes off and refreshes and do, double doesn't remember uh, wh where we are. Um, uh, Chris Primer says, for $20, thank you very much. It means so much. Deeply troubling. I agree. It is very. It is deeply troubling. Uh, MF Corp says in 2004, Israel banned Monster Munch in Palestine. The, the absolute monsters. How do, I mean, that if you want to declare anything a human right, it should be the right to eat Monster Munch. So, so there we go. Um, and then uh, over on entropy, I mean, my entropy hasn't kind of, kind of. If anybody sent anything on entropy, I don't think anybody has. I'm still seeing those same messages from the White Knight from. You know, I was getting, I was getting entropies last night on unpopular opinions, but um, I can't see any new ones today, and I can't see the ones from last night either. Entropy's been a bit buggered for a while. Uh, let me just see if there's anything in the revenue bit. Lindsey Graham has been speaking at Trump's rallies to massive boos, says Holocron Records. That was from last night, no doubt. Okay, well, I can't see any new ones from today, so uh, that will be all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully this uh, document that we read remains like a kind of fantasy nightmare of Gordon Brown's and never actually comes to fruition. But, uh, you know, there's only one man who can stop it happening in this world. And we all know who that man is. Uh, the Right Honourable Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of the UK, founder of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. We're delighted.
traveling across the seas to help save all the other countries. But the day you left, the country fell to its knees. So I say, Tony Blair, T Man, B L A I R, you're in our hearts. I know you have to go. Doesn't 